Shall we start? Yoko, shall we start? Sure. Lady? Okay, so uh, good evening from Japan. Thank you very much for joining the Future Shapers session entitled Inclusive Innovation for the New Normal in the Vision of Young Researchers. I'm Kazuyoshi Nishijima, a member, of a member of Science Council of Japan and Associate Professor in Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Kyoto University. Hello, I'm Yoko Shinpuku, a former Global Young Academy Executive Committee, a former Vice Chair of the Young Academy of Japan, and a professor in Global Health Nursing in Hiroshima University. I, and I'm moderating this session with Dr. Nishijima. This session is a panel discussion by future shapers to find out what a science and technology can do to realize inclusive innovation for the new normal based on the three keywords, evidence, decision, and action. The theme of the discussion is what are we willing to do with the future of science and technology as future shapers. Today's panelists are the following. First, our important guest, Ministry Audrey Tan, the Digital Minister of Taiwan. And Dr. Nova Ahmed from Bangladesh. Uh, Dr. Paulina Carmona Mola from USA. Dr. Yasuhiro Kondo from Japan. Dr. Roberto Lepenis from Germany. Dr. Felix Moronta Barrios from Italy. Dr. Yumiko Nakajima from Japan. Dr. Hiroko Tokoro from Japan. And Mr. Takeo Tsukamoto from Japan. We expect uh, your active contribution to the discussion and we hope the panel discussion is useful for both the panelists and the audience. Now, uh, let us immediately start the first part of the session with a speech by Ministry Audrey Tam. Please start, the screen is yours. Good time, everyone. Uh, is my audio and video coming through? Uh, I see the caption, so it must be a yes. Really happy to be here virtually to talk about how we can enable digital social innovation for fast evidence making, for fair decision making, and also fun action making. Now, COVID-19 has stress test democracies across the world, and the result, well, varies. <clears throat> Many democracies, including those in our region, have been revealed as being flawed in this way or another, when grasping between the trade-off post inherently by managing the pandemic and the infodemic and the lure of going toward takedowns or lockdowns. But it is really surprising though, given that we have done so little to modernize these institutions that stretch back to ancient Athens. Taiwan, I'm glad to report, has shown how we can strengthen and deepen democracy across our region with citizen engagement and to ensure that democracies continue to flourish and decision making is not limited to just everyone uploading three bits every four years called voting. We need to re-empower our populations and make our institutions fit for the world in which we live in. Now, Taiwan's transformation to a digital democracy took place within a generation. Since the Second World War, my country has made itself from a relatively simple agricultural society with power, decision-making power, concentrated in the hands of a few in the ruling party, to today, we are a state characterized by social, cultural, and political pluralism. And one of the key impact from the technology sector is the World Wide Web. The popularization of the web technology in 1996 is right around the time when we had our first direct presidential election. 
So the internet in Taiwan and democracy evolved and spread in tandem. In 2014, there was a definitive moment in Taiwan's democratic invigoration, the birth of the Sunflower Movement. Half a million people took to the street to demonstrate against the cross-strait service trade agreement, a opaque trade deal with Beijing, and many more people support him as online. But the movement fanned out not as a demonstration for protest, but a demonstration for demo. It's about demoing how people empowered with civic technologies can gather the evidence together, make decisions together, and take collective action. And in the first few days, rumor and misinformation naturally spread about what was occurring inside the besieged parliament. And to ensure openness and transparency, I was there to help set up a system of communication, as were many from the decentralized G0V or Gov0 community, a group of civic technologists. The occupied area and the surrounding streets were connected in a local network. Projectors were set up outside the parliament to what was happening in the real time to everyone watching online. So it ended a little more than three weeks later in Occupy after the entire government and the civil servants promised greater legislative oversight and also endorsed this successful public demonstration of a new version of governance of people gathering the evidence together and the state amplifying these evidences and then take actions along with the private sector. And I call this the people public private partnership. Of course, I look forward uh, to have more exchanges in the panel, including how we enable these partnerships through the annual presidential hackathon and the digital public infrastructure built from such hackathons, including the air pollution map for climate science and so on, eventually evolved into the mask rationing map, the SMS-based checking method that shortened our contact tracing from 24 hours to 24 minutes, which enable us to counter the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic with no takedowns. But I want to first outline the basic principles of us working with the people, not for the people, and take collective action through collective intelligence. So that, that was it, because I was told that uh, my remark need to be short at the beginning. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Ministry Tan, for important and suggestive uh, speech. Now, we would like to, to start panel discussion. And let me explain how to do the panel discussion. Dear panelists, please first uh, switch on your camera if you don't. And when you wish to say something, please raise your hand in a way that uh, I can see it on WebEx uh, screen. Then I will appoint who to speak. Uh, in your first talk, please introduce yourself to Ministry Tom as well as to the audience. Please also stand by Interpretex. And for simultaneous translation, please uh, speak slowly. Also, please um, uh, note that mute your microphone when you don't speak. Okay, so uh, who want to open uh, the discussion? Yes, Nova, please. I am, uh, hello, I'm Nova Ahmed from Bangladesh. Uh, I was a former executive committee member of Global Young Academy, and uh, I'm a um, founding member of National Young Academy in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, and uh, I send my salam to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> oh, everybody is so excited that you hesitate to, to start uh, the discussion. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, 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 please. Kondo. I'm an associate professor at the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature, Kyoto, Japan. And also, I'm a member of uh, the Young Academy of Japan. So, I, uh, my, uh, I am a researcher, and my interest is in civic technology. So, just, uh, Minister Tan, you uh, explained that emphasizes importance of it in governance. 
So I have a question. Yeah, as well as in Taiwan, in Japan also, uh, there is an increasing number of civic uh, technologies uh, tackling uh, local issues with government and other sectors. However, sometimes a civic technologist is a really technology oriented. They are geek or otaku. So they like technology and they may make a uh, found a great fun in working with local people. However, uh, sometimes they are much too much uh, technology oriented and sometimes uh, they overlook uh, the uh, voice of uh, local people, especially for marginalized people, uh, like uh, um, low income people and also children, uh, elder people, they are, have a divide, digital divide people. So uh, I'm asking you, Mr. Tan, how can we be inclusive with this kind of marginalized people? If you have any insight, please share with us. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Do I answer straight away? Okay. Uh, yes, please. So, um, I think one of the most powerful idea that I have uh, encountered is to empower people closest to the pain, to the suffering. So rather than asking anyone to adapt to civic technology, civic technologists must see ourselves inherently as uh, the tool makers and the tools we're not uh, perfect in designing those tools. We just need to be good enough. That is to say, make sure that the senior people, the elderly, people with low income in rural areas, indigenous nations, and so on, can remix and make full use of the technology as they see fit. I'll use an example. For example, when we designed the SMS-based check-in method so that people can, uh, without downloading any app, just scan a QR code and hit send, and that's it, because it sends to a toll-free number, 1922. Uh, so it takes like literally two seconds to complete a check-in with no app installed. But the first thing we did was to make sure that people who don't have a smartphone is also part of the design process. So we specifically designed that these people using feature phones, or if they don't know how to use a camera, can type in the 15 digit code of the location code post posted near the QR code on the same poster and text that to a trusted number 1922 and completing the same check in. And even for people who don't have a phone at all, we said uh, the, the people queuing before or after them or the family can make sure that they just have a plus two plus three, uh, making sure that uh, they take the uh, charge the responsibility of informing these people when the contact tracer informs them so they don't have to check in themselves. And the rural places, even the indigenous nations, sometimes they have these uh, seals, uh, things that are uh, ink applied to paper, uh, like a name card stuff. So even people with seeing difficulties, they're not compelled to use a scanning base, which is fundamentally not friendly to people with seeing difficulties, but rather they can just hand out slips uh, with their contact number to the venue and store uh, instead to the telecom store instead in the venue. So the idea to heuristic is that first, we never invent new data collection point that didn't exist before the pandemic. So people don't have to trust someone they didn't use to trust. And second, we always make sure that we design such processes without mandating any top-down one and only way to do it. Anytime anyone innovates socially to improve on our approach, we definitely say, yeah, that's a better idea than what we originally determined. And that requires a commitment to open standard and also to daily every 2 p.m. press conference response, a shortened iteration cycle on governance and feedback. Thank you very much. I understand that the mixed, good mixture of high and low technologies are really important to make a more inclusive innovation. Thank you very much. Yes, it's an old idea called appropriate technology. Yeah. Yes, um, Carl Mona. 
everyone. Uh, hello, Minister Chang. I, it was a pleasure to hear that as a scientist, I'm, I'm Paulina Carmona Mora, I'm biochemist and research scientist at the University of California, Davis in the United States. Uh, my question comes from a, a science point of view, but first I want to say how empowering it was to hear that the, the people is involved in the decision making process um through the hackathons that you mentioned it, it's like a, a, i think it's a very empowering system and, and builds trust uh in people in the government uh i'm thinking how to start um from the start um how to as a scientist how can a scientist like me for example can approach a minister with their science to explain the importance of their science in the society what will be the impact of their discoveries in the society. So how can we start the process? Do you separate um, people uh, from scientists in, in, in your concept of, of governing with people? This is an excellent question. In Taiwan, when we teach science, including data science, climate science, and so on, in primary and middle school, we emphasize on competence, not just literacy. It's different, those two concepts. To teach media literacy, data literacy, digital literacy, is to make sure that the students understand the science. But to teach competence means that they must become contributors to science. And only when contributing to science can students learn about the rigor that is associated with scientific research. For example, uh, most of our uh, climate sensing of the weather stations, it used to be monopolized by large machines in the Environmental Protection Agency and its associates naturally. But because people worry about PM 2.5, which is a new health hazard, so they start a civic movement called the air box movement so that all the primary schools, tens of thousands of them, measure the PM 2.5 as part of their teaching of natural sciences as young as the primary school. Now, these ideas, uh, the data stewardship, data bias, distributed ledger, and so on, are very difficult to teach, but they are very natural to learn. Once you become a data controller and contribute to this decentralized computing network, and also by empowering the student so that every one of them have access to the machine learning clusters to tweak their algorithms through simple interface like Scratch, they become contributors to environmental science, just as the media competence classes teach them to fact check the three presidential candidates uh, in real time during their debate and platform and so on. So they become media contributors and fact checkers too. And by taking an active stance in the learning process, they learn the idea of science as something that we do together rather than something you read from the textbooks. And I believe only by combining such basic education and lifelong education on competence towards solving common social and environmental challenges, can scientists be seen as an approachable kind of community tribe member rather than someone who writes our textbooks? Thank you so much. That was very insightful. Yes, Loberto. Um, I think Can you you're unmute, Robert. Muted somehow. Roberto, maybe you muted. I cannot hear you. And somehow your voice doesn't doesn't come through. Come come through. Maybe you can type your questions, perhaps. Yeah. We're all multimedia, multimodal people here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, maybe no one's first. Uh, no, nobody. Did you raise your hand? 
and I wrote the question uh, on the chat. Okay, okay, so so you, you fast, and then next Felix, and then Roberto. Okay. Okay, uh, my one actually was related to the first question. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would like to hear, I mean, because uh, we were talking about digital divide, I think some of it is answered, but again, coming from a developing country, this comes frequently to my mind uh, because technology makes a big barrier. Uh, so um, when, when you are thinking about uh, spreading technology to civil pe people, can, can technology turn away people? I mean, somebody wanted to join, but that person is probably feeling shaky. And um, <clears throat> because now te technology dependency is increasing, uh, do you think the digital divide is also increasing? Because I mean, sometimes I feel in that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I mean, some, some uh, advice uh, would feel, make me feel good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, as I mentioned, why people already trust this toll-free number 1922 is because since the pandemic began last uh, February, anyone can call toll-free and speak their, to their heart's content about what their worries are about the pandemic, their uh, suggestions, what have they have found um, in the ground. For example, uh, last April, a young boy called this toll-free number saying, uh, you're rationing our mask, but all I got was pink mask, and all the boys in my class have navy blue ones. They don't want to wear pink to school. Uh, and the very next day, all the medical officers wore pink uh, in the press conference, and Minister uh, of Health even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the, the hippest boy in his class, for only he has the color that the hero as well. And, and I believe these are the inclusive, uh, appropriate technologies, literally a toll-free number. And we don't apply, for example, uh, voice recognition on the voice recording. Uh, they're dialing to people from the largest charities in Taiwan, the most professional call centers and so on, who listen with empathy, uh, their stories and so on. Of course, escalating their ideas and making sure there's a common uh, thread of uh, frequently asked questions. These are the support technologies, but these technologies are there to connect people to people. It's not to replace anyone from a people to people connection. That is to say they are assistive rather than authoritarian. So I believe we need to develop not machine learning, but collaborative learning. That is to say, learning apparatuses that always joins more people together rather than excluding people away. And we can do this by asking this very simple question, does this leave anyone behind by introducing this touch point, this technological invention? Thank you. So, uh, 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 yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's great. Uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. It's an honor to share the screen with Minister uh, Tang and all the panelists, of course. Uh, I am Felix. I am talking to you from Italy, from the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology. Here I am a program specialist in uh, regula regulatory science and biotechnology. And my question is, um, I mean, the, the genetic resources are not linked anymore to samples or to the physical specimen. This is because the revolution in genetics and in sequencing technologies, the sequencing of DNA and so on. So um, I, I, I would like to know if the, in, in Taiwan, how are you dealing with the digitalization of life, of the life information, the sharing of, of uh, genetic data, particularly from the point of view of the biodiversity? Because I know that from humans is uh, uh, different and uh, sensitive topic, but what about the, the digitalization of the biodiversity and your genetic resources? Yeah, this is a very important question. And uh, assuming I heard you correctly, uh, the question was about uh, how do we manage the governance for the digitalization of our personal health records, including our um, DNA and other genetic material and uh, the 
kind of precision uh, use of it in a way that still is uh, democratic or accessible? Is that the question? And including also the digitalization of um, biodiversity. I mean, plants, animals, microbial. Uh, okay, so not just biodiversity. Biodiversity. Not okay. yeah. Right. It is, I, I think it's a great uh, question. Indeed, uh, in Taiwan, we have this concept of the national healthcare system and the associated biobank system where people can voluntarily contribute to research and join data coalitions that uh, activates certain researchers through their voluntary dedication, which they can, of course, uh, withdraw from uh, any particular uh, projects they're not comfortable with and join only the ones uh, that fully informs them and so on. I believe this is a um, internationally recognized way of doing such things. But I think we do a step forward uh, even by making sure that uh, these data must be used only in a way that is empowering the individuals. That is to say, either through personalized medicine that you uh, authorize only the uh, trusted uh, partners inside your data collection to use your data instead of blank uh, authorizing any particular centralized uh, info bank or data holder to make all your decisions for you, the decisions are made in a way that is democratic. and. People, uh, I think more than one quarter, I think maybe a third now, uh, have this personal National Health Insurance Express application that manages such consent and such participation. And it ranges from, for example, dedicating the uncollected mask quota to international humanitarian aid in exchange for your name. Uh, uh, coined into a NFT like recognition. That's also one of the data collections. So it doesn't always have to be genetic. It's just a act of joining together uh, the data that we personally care and care as a community and has a high level of trust because by law, uh, there must be no uh, unauthorized commercial uses of any of such data as part of the um, national obligation. It's um, mandatory health insurance and therefore, of course, people has the highest privacy and cybersecurity expectation of it. And I look forward for this model to extend toward uh, the biodiversity in many presidential hackathon cases we're already looking at uh, people's uh, coexistence uh, with the local plants, with the trees and the local biome of uh, forestry and so on, and people committing uh, to maintaining them together to our environmental benefits by having a kind of simulated group dialogue and group decision making uh, with what, what they call patch by planting, making patches uh, by planting, by talking to such simulated uh, ecosystems. So it's extending this uh, data collision a little bit by introducing synthesized avatars and so on as part of the decision making, because at the moment forests don't vote and this is our um, kind of approximation of a voting forest uh, but in the future i believe democracy itself will be upgraded to include more of the biodiversity and also future generations is a very large seminar topic so i answer in very uh, large brushes yeah thank you and now uh, Roberto uh, made a comment on the chat, but maybe uh, Roberto, you can try to speak once again. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. can't. Yeah, it, can't. It's, it's okay, we, we see your question. Yeah, so it's about institutionalization uh, of the hackathons. So our hackathons, uh, they are three months to four months long. So it's a real marathon, like a very extended amount of time. Uh, and the proof of concepts, five teams each year receive a trophy from the president and a trophy shape of Taiwan is a micro projector underneath, which you, if you turn on, it projects Dr. Tsai ing handing you the trophy. So it's very meta, it describes itself. Uh, and uh, what it symbolizes is that the president takes your idea, whatever you did in the past three months and commit to it as a presidential 
promise, like a platform for the next 12 months. So we commit ourselves to utilize whatever budget, personnel, or even legal uh, amendments uh, to make those ideas happen. And the reason why the president uh, can make such a uh, firm commitment is because all the winning cases need to be quadratic voted, meaning we use a new voting method to maximize the synergy of the uh, ideas and the projects, uh, a key output must always correspond to one or more of the global goals of the SDGs, uh, the 169 specific targets. So with the popular legitimacy and the global uh, goal as its benefits, uh, it, it can do no wrong, right? It's just about setting priority. It's not about whether we should do this or not. And so uh, whatever solutions they develop win the support across the sectors, including the public servants, the private sector, and the civil society activists. Uh, all three sectors must join in order for a team to win, to be eligible for the five presidential hackathon uh, trophies. And we have a national regulation that regulates this. So in many senses, we learn from, say, the prototype fund from Germany and many other similar designs around the world. But uh, the main difference is that because we prove there's democratic legitimacy plus global goals, uh, which we all, of course, commit already to realize, uh, that makes it favorable for the president to say, okay, whatever the top five team uh, does, uh, its presidential platform and all of it can be tracked at the presidential hackathon website. Thank you very much. On behalf of Roberto. Um, uh, may I ask one question? Yes. Uh, done. Yes. Well, Nova mentioned a uh, digital divide, which is an, a divide uh, between the people who have an access to the technology and who don't. Well, now uh, I, I also see the problem exists in the cyber, uh, cyber net space. There are uh, disconnected or divided groups, and those uh, divisions are created by uh, wrong information or information that scientifically can uh, not be approved or sometimes uh, uh, information we cannot uh, judge. So my question is how a scientist can help uh, connect those divided uh, group existed in the cybernet because uh, in the cybernet, uh, cybernetic spaces, information flows very fast uh, compared to the physical world. So how and if the scientist can uh, help uh, these cyber networks uh, to direct in the right uh, direction? Yes, uh, this is fundamentally about uh, vaccinating the mind, mm -hmm. right? Because conspiracy theories uh, and this information, infodemic in general, are like virus of the mind. Uh, once people get into a conspiratorial mindset, then they turn whatever energy of outrage that could have been used to further social movement. But conspiracy theory mindset turns those outrage into negative energy for discrimination, for revenge, and uh, further polarization. So it's a vicious cycle and on um, this part, and a virtuous cycle um, channeling outrage into social progress. So it's uh, about making sure that we establish together a pro-social social media. And in Taiwan, for example, uh, the place when Dr. Li Wenliang uh, surfaced that there were uh, seven SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market, that was the last day of 2019 when that uh, news spread to Taiwan. But uh, we didn't discover it through the more anti-social corner of social media, say Facebook and so on. But we discovered that uh, in the PTT. Uh, PTT is sometimes said to be Taiwan's Reddit but it's not because it's a, a scientific endeavor. It's a national Taiwan University computer science department project that has been running for 25 years with zero 
advertisement and zero shareholders is firmly in the academic sector. And the PTT uh, is open sourced, collaboratively governed, and they develop a lot of ways for people to express their collective intelligence strictly in a pro-social manner. So when Dr. Li Wenliang's whistleblowing spread to PTT, uh, experts from all different areas triaged that message and found it's probably true, which led to the very next day we start health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. That is to say, it reached the top of the scientific decision makers in the government uh, in this PTT. And that's because after 25 years working together in a pro-social public infrastructure, we come to trust each other when we um, divulge such analysis uh, in a real time so that these um, clarifications almost working like vaccination of the mind, people who have participated in those quick but deliberative conversations, they become immune to the conspiracy theories that followed uh, almost directly afterward uh, that has spread uh, to the entire world about uh, the virus. So uh, long story short, I believe uh, only when we design with intention the spaces of our interactions such that we can very quickly surface the common values out of very different seeming positions. Can we uh, come together and say, okay, there's a lot of debate last year about the mask use and uh, efficiency of mask, but very quickly the pro-social social media told us nobody dispute that masks are there to protect yourself from your own unwashed hand. Nobody dispute that. And because we were able to discover that very quickly, so all our communication material, including the very cute dog, the Shiba Inu, with the name Zong Chai, that put their foot to their uh, mouths and so on, uh, it reached pretty much everybody. <laughs> and then that firmly established a, a humor over rumor uh, public um, atmosphere so that people, when engaged with conspiracy theory, laugh about it, laugh the tension off, and then are in the mindset of doing some science. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? Yes, Yoko. Um, in relation to what you have said, um, that it's about communication. I think now, um, as a scientist, we value reasoning or objectivity or data and those things. But to communicate with general citizens or other stakeholders, as you said, it's important to uh, think about more feelings or culture or values or sensibility, those kind of a kind of soft part of human beings. Um, as a digital minister, uh, how do you think about uh, this soft kind of human being and also um, uh, how we can like harmonize this reasoning part of scientists and human side of sciences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very important question. Indeed, when we think about science and technology, maybe because Taiwan used to be a hardware focused economy, uh, in Taiwan, when we say science and technology, people immediately think of the natural sciences like physics and apply technology to the industry like semiconductors. Uh, that becomes the reference case of science and technology in Taiwan. But uh, as my role is that of social innovation, I keep reminding people that social science is also science and social technology indeed including democracy itself is also technology because uh, like nonviolent communication dynamic facilitation people don't usually refer to them as technology uh, well except open space technology which calls itself technology but all these are important technologies that uh, make the human side of a, a community shine forth so that we can have the rough consensus before we work on the running code. Indeed, the native culture that I come from, the Internet Engineering Task Force culture, uh, emphasized coming together to show the rough consensus and then work on the running code, not the other way around. So it means that uh, settling on something we can all live with, it doesn't need to be perfect, something we can live with, that is the most important thing. And so uh, I want to uh, go back to the pro-social social media for example, when we uh, set up 
public consultations online. We deliberately uh, have the uh, supporting arguments and the contradicting arguments in two different uh, upvote and downvote columns, but they never reply to one another. And this very simple design took away any polarization because there's no way to call each other by name or start a flame war, but you can very quickly see the best arguments just surface on the top of the cream of the crop of the two uh, columns. And that is how we then address them to say, oh, uh, it looks like they are uh, polarized, but it's actually not. We all care about the same thing together. And this is our design on the public petition website, our public consultation website. They all follow this idea of taking away the space for um, mischaracterizing each other and putting into it's dynamic facilitator and moderators space by assisting human moderators, not taking them away into automated moderation. Thank you very much. Social innovation as technology is a very uh, kind of encouraging uh, message for us. Thank you. Thank you. Any more or any other uh, questions? Maybe Nakajima-san? Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, please. Ah, thank you very much. I'm Yumiko Nakajima from Japan. A member of GYA and also a team leader, team leader of the National Institute in Japan. So, so my question is really related to the previous one and the, I already might have a quick <laughs> the answer but the the using the SNS or other digital media then we can pick up the uh, various amount of idea from the people which is very impressive for me mm. but as discussed already, the, to pick up the really important idea from the vast amount of the, the idea, it might be very difficult, especially if you need to respond within 24 hours or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can we yes. overcome this problem or challenge using the technologies or any yes. calculation system or something like that. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Uh, so um, I'm showing a, a screen of a real consultation that I mentioned uh, online. Uh, it's part of the polis.gov.tw system, which is free software mm -hmm. as a system uh, that we've used since 2015. And AI here means assistive intelligence. It assists the human facilitation and moderation. In 2015, we presented the facts about UberX, about the so-called ride sharing. Some people say it's uh, gig economy. Some people say it's platform economy. Some people say it's sharing economy, but it's uh, all very complex. And people felt very differently about it. So what you see uh, here is actually the actual uh, image of the feelings of my friends and families and everyone on the social media uh, when we talk thousands of people on the UberX meta. We will go on to talk about many other meta, but this was the first. And the uh, way it works is that you see one sentiment from your fellow citizen on the police interface. For example, here, I say, I think that passenger liability insurance should be mandatory, regardless of whether the driver is legal, the passenger needs to be insured. Now, you may agree, if you click agree, you move uh, toward me. If you click disagree, you move farther away from me. But as I mentioned, there is no reply button, <clears throat> so there's no room for troll to grow. And the uh, automated clustering, k-means clustering, is calculated by each person proposing their sentiments for other people to respond. So it's not a traditional survey where the designer of the survey dominates the frame setting. This is a wiki survey where everybody can add new dimensions to this multidimensional space. 
and the x and y axis are determined by principal component analysis. Again, the data is open so people can very quickly uh, verify that the system is working as intended. So this is assistive intelligence, but not deep learning. This is intentionally not deep because people must be able to easily calculate and verify that it is doing justice uh, to their sentiments. And every time we run such conversations, we find this picture, which if you have one image to take home of this conversation, I want it to be this one, is a shape of democracy. Indeed, people agree to disagree on a few ideological things like sharing economy versus gig economy. But actually, most people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things, most of the time. It was just those five things dominates the mainstream media and anti-social corner of social media. But once we have a truly pro-social space where people can reflect on each other's feelings, just like a physical town hall, a physical public library, a physical academic campus, uh, we bring the digital counterpart like post to it, then people reflect and realize, oh, we all care about insurance about not undercutting existing meters, about empowering local church and temples to set up Uber-like, uh, ride-sharing fleets and so on. And that's exactly what we legislated the very next year, solving the Uber problem once and for all. So Uber is a legal taxi in Taiwan for quite some time now. So I believe this is one of the potential uh, innovations in digital democracies that lifts us out of this um, the principal uh, agent uh, dilemma, the, the uh, thing about the representatives, of course, not being able to understand all the aspects of their um, constituents. So instead of representing them, we need to have such space that represents them, that propose those initially minority ideas and then have a way to reflect on each other and come to something that we all can live with. And this is all about interaction design. In other corner of antisocial social media, you probably see the flip of this picture. Yeah, thank you. The, the, the conclusion always much the government policy Yes, of course. <laughs> really? <laughs> mm, that's amazing and interesting. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, Carol, Mona. And uh, now that we have been um, talking about the democracy process, the decision making process, I would like to know, um, for example, as a scientist, what would you expect in your interactions with scientists in this decision-making process? Uh, in other words, how do you envision this rapport with scientists? Uh, and feel free to throw any tips to us scientists that we want to know how, how can we bridge this gap uh, between the decision-making process and the discoveries that we generate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that it's not about a few scientists in the society and everybody else. I believe this is more like a ladder of expertise, a, a very gentle slope where e everyone and anyone can find someone that's just a little bit more involved with the scientific community, but still speak in a language they can understand. And each and every citizen can also go around and then teach people who are slightly more junior in any scientific endeavor. So that whenever there's a new discovery about, for example, the alpha or delta or some new Greek variant of the COVID virus, and we need to adjust our way to cope and adapt uh, with it, then this reason why is translated very quickly across the slope rather than people being mystified why does the rule have changed again from the top so i believe that the decision makers need first to be themselves scientists 
Taiwan benefits uh, during the pandemic by having both of our vice presidents in the past two years being public health um, experts. And indeed, the first vice president uh, on the first year of pandemic, Chen Jianren, literally wrote the epidemiology textbook. So the authority, the scientific authority on epidemiology. So when he wants to talk to the president, he just, you know, goes next door. And, and I believe uh, this uh, very good relationship made sure that we all focus on helping the vice president, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the vice premier at a time, which was a student of the vice president, uh, to make mm, popular online courses, MOOCs, uh, that teaches basic epidemiology, developing computer games that simulates uh, lockdowns versus uh, pervasive mask use, uh, develop cute memes, uh, the dog memes that I just mentioned, and so on. Uh, and so that means that everyone has something to do and by supporting them to produce such memes uh, and uh, interactive applications and so on, I myself learned about uh, epidemiology very quickly and swiftly by just working on the physical distancing uh, posture. Uh, when you're indoor, keep three Shibas away, outdoor, keep two of those away. Uh, and this one, of course, is about not putting a uh, hand in your mouth. A mask prevents you from doing that and so on. And all those communication uh, efforts make sure that people feel, oh, I can also remix a little bit and introduce the signs to my community. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your, your vision of this. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Tsukamoto. Um, excuse me, uh, please uh, unmute your microphone. Yeah, thank you. Please Sorry. speak slowly. Sorry. Better now. Yes. Uh, my name is Taki Tsukamoto, uh, yes. cabinet, uh, cabinet Office of Japan. Um, uh, ah, I'm sorry, I, I make my uh, talk with Japanese. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, use. Uh, yes, so everybody, please uh, switch on your interpret text and then uh, you will be able to translate it uh, 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 words of uh, Mr. Tsukamoto. はい、えっと、ま、あの、I do not see. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's a really important question, right? It's whether we can turn the social innovation somehow also into business and industrial innovations and have them play well together so it may lead to new models of economy, if I understand your question uh, right. Um, I, I think uh, the main idea, indeed the presidential uh, science campaign promise of a circular economy is like the Japanese society 5.0, it's about making the economy work in such a way that prosper uh, not just this, but future generations. And the main theoretical point was that it's very difficult to account to seven generations down the line. It's very difficult to make long-term predictions of our decisions and so on. In specific uh, areas, such as climate modeling, of course, the scientists have made tremendous progress to actually visualize and make real the uh, 
popular imagination of the worst case and the best case and somehow find the scientific evidence to uh, let us know that we don't have to scare ourselves, but yet we have to take actions now. So I think climate um, epidemic uh, and counter disinformation, uh, these are the areas that of global urgency and therefore we see the new business models on circular economy, on hardening the cybersecurity and designing on new um, zero trust um, distributed uh, network. Uh, and this is of course a large industry now with 5G and internet of things and beings uh, cybersecurity. And we also see new business models that sprung out of the data coalitions that I just mentioned, for example, in Taiwan, the national health insurance, uh, thanks to the uh, data collisions and the voluntary participation, we were able to do precision modeling, not just on the, um, the interventions of medicine, but also on preventative health care, and indeed something that might be called precision public health, that is to say, making sure that we can discover new products and services that integrate into uh, the insurance plans and so on to make sure that people who are more well informed of their health and their habits impact on their community's health can make uh, more healthy decisions. And that itself, of course, is a industry. But we must always um, keep in mind that it's only valuable if it's also valuable to the least technologically advanced person interacting with the technology. Otherwise, it's very exploitative. It's essentially faking the consent. So by making sure that we focus on the privacy enhancing technologies, uh, the latest ones such as federated learning, homomorphic encryption, and so on. I believe this will create new economic opportunities once we understand the bad old days of uh, blindly aggregating personal data and so on actually creates similar to, I don't know, smoking tobacco or some other environmental harm actually creates a huge social negative externality. And once people collective realize that, then whatever new innovations that like carbon capturing, but for the uh, privacy uh, equivalent can be made then into a new business, new economic model, similar to what we have already seen on um, circular economy, clean energy and such. Thank you very much. Um, a time is coming, four minutes left. Um, Hiroko, do you have any question? Uh, my name is Hiroko Tokoro from University of Tsukuba. Um, my main field is material science and medical chemistry. And uh, I am very impressed with the use of Taiwan's cutting edge technology for IT digital stuff like that. I am interested in what does the Taiwanese government think about the coexistence of so-called cutting edge technologies such as IT and the digital with the classical basic science, for example, mathematics, physics, and chemistry, because the source of human being is limited and the source of scientific budget is limited. So I want to listen to the government thinking. Uh, definitely, uh, we are committed to, I believe, um, we have another year of uh, highest ever increase of the budget on the fundamental and basic science and technology research. Uh, but I also want to talk about the popular idea of these investments striving for faster, higher and stronger technology, the most advanced facilities and services will naturally produce so-called high-tech unicorns. Uh, I believe that is a very um, kind of narrow, uh, linear thinking. I believe once we work on the cutting edge research uh, by making the unknown into the known, uh, like the Olympic spirit, right? This year is not just about faster, higher, stronger, it's about together. That is to say, to, uh, to have the entire society understand the fundamental science principles among the 
basic social and environmental challenges that we are facing together. And so uh, even when the Japanese people call me the, the IT uh, minister, I always said that IT only connects machines and digital connects people. And I believe that it's not a zero sum thing. Of course, we need to have the fundamentals. Uh, otherwise, we can't connect people if the internet is not a human right, which it is in Taiwan. Broadband is a human right, but we must think in terms not just about broadband as a human right. We must think about how democracy expresses itself through broadband, once we have higher bit rates, how to do collective decision making, once we connect the Internet of Things together, how to make it an Internet of Beings, once we have the latest virtual reality gears, how to make it a shared, not a solo reality. Uh, I already talked about how we turn machine learning into collaborative learning and equally important from user experience into human experience. So a lot of my work is just to ensure that whenever people say, hey, the singularity is near on this field or another, I keep reminding everyone that the plurality is here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you very much. We have very little time left, uh, but before we close this uh, first uh, part of the session, I would like to ask uh, you, Ministry Audrey, uh, one thing. Well, uh, we all uh, want, we all are scientists and uh, uh, we are in academia, but we also want to contribute to the decision process in the society. How we, a scientist, can contribute uh, in what way we should uh, contribute to the decision process in the society? Yeah, I would encourage you to increase the R value, the basic transmission rate of your research. Uh, make the idea worth spreading spread, make it viral. And uh, even if it's not your particular um, hobby, right, to, to make memes like the ones that I just introduced to you, find someone who is slightly less um senior slightly less trained in your field but still interested in learning from you as a byproduct of learning from you ask them to publish what they have learned uh, in any art form whatsoever but they will then in turn affect more people affect more people and so on uh, for example um, through the uh, popular medium of film fiction my first exposure to harry potter is not the canon of harry potter books but rather uh, the Harry Potter and the Rational Method, which is a fan fiction of Harry Potter written uh, with science uh, in mind. Uh, and I believe this is a great crossover of decision theory or whatever artificial intelligence research that's cutting edge at a time with Harry Potter. And I look specifically for the communities like this when I want to spread the uh, uh, newest ideas that I run across. Thank you for a very uh, encouraging and warm message uh, to, to us, but also to all the young uh, scientists. Well, thank you, uh, Ministry uh, Tan. Thank you very much for your uh, valuable input for future shapers and also uh, uh, panelists. Thank you very much for your active participation to the panel discussion. Um, now we go to the second half of the session. Thank you, uh, Ministry. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very good question. Thank you. Live long and prosper. Bye.